Welcome to the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, a podcast that explores nature and wildlife photography in your own backyard and throughout the United States. Welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, episode 10, I'm going to look at an ongoing project that I'm involved with, looking at the potential of stock photography. In short, is stock photography worth it? Now, a a quick definition of stock photography is probably in order. Um, A stock agency is an agency, usually online now, that a photographer submits photographs to, and then those photographs are marketed to individuals who would like to buy those photographs. Uh, In today's world, this stock photography is, or stock agencies in specific, are online, and they accept digital media. In the past, stock agencies would actually, you would actually submit a portfolio of of slides and those slides would be sold to magazines and so forth. In today's world, it's all electronic. So this ongoing project that I'm involved in is looking at the merits or the pros and cons of using stock agencies. Now, there are primarily three types of stock agencies. There is first micro stock, uh, secondly there's mid stock, and third is high end stock photography. I want to start with micro stock. Micro stock is probably the easiest way for a budding photographer to submit images and get into position to sell them. Micro stock agencies are kind of what I call the Walmart of of stock photography. They primarily target individuals who cannot afford the higher agency stock prices. For example, you you might have a website and you need to have a picture of two guys shaking hands. You would go to a micro stock agency and you'd pay a fraction of the cost of going to say a mid stock or a high end stock photography agency. So micro stock micro stock fills that that need of the average man to get imagery. So how do you submit to how do you submit and become a contributor to stock agencies um, usually with micro stock you're going to be creating a portfolio of about 10 to 20 images that are one perfectly sharp pretty much noise free and of good subjects if you can put together 10 or 15 photos like that you'll probably easily be accepted at stock agencies like Shutterstock, Fotolia, Dreams Time. Um, these are just a few of the of the micro stock agencies out there. Currently, there are four stock agencies that are considered top tier micro stock agencies. Shutterstock probably coming in still at number one, although lately they've kind of been fading a little bit. Fotolia, who was recently purchased by Adobe, also referred to as Adobe Stock probably the big up-and-comer. They're probably getting close to, to taking over Shutterstock's position. Dreams Time is up there also in that uh, in that mix, although they really have fallen down. And iStock, of course, remains a solid player in the microstock world. So microstock is primarily where you're going to go if you're new to photography or new to stock creating stock imagery. The second type of of stock agency is called mid stock. And mid stock agencies they cater more to a select audience. A lot of editorial images go through mid stock agencies. High end commercial images sell better in mid stock agencies. The one I belong to is called Alamy, and Alamy has been around for a long, long time. They were actually around before uh, the internet stock agencies uh, boom back in the mid. I, don't know, I guess around 2004 is when that really started taking off. But they've been around for a long time. You can still make money with them, and you make a lot of money compared to to Microstock. I do recommend getting involved with with Alamy, although it's much harder to get past their QC initially than it is with the Microstock agencies. The third type of stock agency is is like what I call high end stock. It's a little bit of a misnomer. Personally, I I don't know if I would call this high-end stock. There are just as many great photographs in micro stock as there are in 
uh, these high-end agencies like Offset. What these high-end agencies try to do is one, they try to find really, really good images. So they have a, a little bit better curation process. And curation just means how they select the photographs. And so places like Offset try to find photographers that are more well-known, photographers that have a little bit of clout maybe on the internet, maybe they're uh, podcasters, someone that has great knowledge of photography. That's who they're looking for. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that their images are better necessarily than the mid-stock guy or the micro-stock guy. It's just that they are looking for the cream of the crop. And, uh, you know, if your photography is good enough and you have a, a name for yourself out there, you know, you will probably end up doing high-end stock photography at one point or another. I just, I, I think the term high-end is a little bit of a marketing term mostly. But you do tend to make a lot more money per image. We're going to get into that a little bit in a minute. So let's th let's concentrate on micro stock for a moment because I think that's where most people are going to want to dip their toe into the water, so to speak. We're going to I'm going to list several pros and several cons as to why I think micro stock is good or isn't good. First, micro stock micro stock forces you to think more about what makes a quality image. So one of the first things that I noticed about micro stock when I first started getting involved is that at least you have some kind of curation process for your images. Now, it's not like getting a portfolio review from a well-known photographer. It's not like putting your images in front of Moose Peterson and saying, are these good? But it does give you some kind of litmus test as to whether your images make the grade. And so for that, I think Microstock is good because they'll reject your image because of noise. And then you, when you look at the image, a lot of times, yeah, there's more noise that needs that, than needs to be in this image. Um, they're very into focus. They want really sharp focus and they usually like more depth of field than more creative types like in their photographs. Um, this is kind of a source of contention that I have with uh, with microstock agencies. Uh, in wildlife photography, as you know, if you have the eye of the bird in focus and part of its head, that's considered in focus. Well, in the microstock world, they might look at that as an out of focus image. You know, you, you might have the eye and the head in focus, but not the entire bill of the of the duck, for example. They don't like that. They'll reject that image probably eight times out of ten, they'll reject it. I guess that's a pro and a con, if you will. But it does give you at least a feeling that they're trying to push you in a direction to make your photography better, or at least more sellable. Uh the next pro is when you get into selling images on micro stock, it's much easier than trying to get into pickier stock agencies like Offset. Okay, I already mentioned this. When you're when you submit to a micro stock agency, you're much more apt to get accepted as a as a contributor to them, and so easy, much easier to get into. Offset is very very difficult to get into. I still have not been accepted there. They're looking for different edgy. Uh, artistic kinds of imagery whereas micro stock is looking more for what will sell to the masses what images will a graphic designer need uh, of a website what what images will uh, the average man want to use in his in his podcast or whatnot so you tend to it, you tend to have a totally different view of what is good between those two agencies the other thing about selling in micro stock, and, and this goes for any stock agency, is that other than creating the photograph, you don't have to expend any energy to sell the image. Yeah, you can market your images through some of their marketing tools, but you don't have to. You can submit your images and just let them handle all the selling, all the marketing, and just collect royalties, which is pretty much what I do when I'm submitting to these agencies. But you're welcome and encouraged to actually market your own images and you know try to sell sell through um, Shutterstock for example they have tools to show a gallery of your images on your website you know, so you're more than welcome to use those tools you just don't have to so what are the cons of the Microstock agency well let's be honest you don't make any money I mean as a photographer you basically make peanuts I kind of think of it like this. You're kind of the blue-collar photographer of the stock world. You're making minimum wage, or maybe slightly above. 
for example, let's look at Shutterstock. Shutterstock is going to give you initially, uh, when you sign up for them, they're going to give you 25 cents an image for subscription images. They're going to give you a dollar eighty-eight an image for on-demand images, and for if you're lucky, you're going to sell some enhanced licenses, and you can make up to eighty dollars a piece for enhanced licenses. Not the norm. What you're probably going to sell the most is the twenty-five cent images. And what what Shutterstock does is they push what's called subscriptions, and all the micro stock agencies do this. They have subscriptions. And what you do is you sign up for a subscription as a consumer or as a user, and they give you, I don't know, I forget what it is now, but they just give you so many images per month to uh, to buy. And it's just one flat fee that you pay, and you can download all those images up to a certain amount per month. As photographers, we make a measly 25 cents an image. So you can see already that micro stock world is all about volume. You know, it's like, you know, if I can sell a thousand images a month, I'm doing pretty good. Whereas high end agencies like Offset or micro st or uh, mid stock agencies like Alamy, you know, you could sell a couple dozen images a month and do pretty well that month. So, totally different, totally different pricing, totally different uh, target audiences, a totally different situation. Another con is that only certain genres of photography sell well. So as a wildlife photographer, you're not going to make a lot of money, okay? You're going to do better than, say, a landscape photographer will, but you're not going to do as well as someone doing commercial images that sell an idea. A perfect example, the classic stock imagery photograph of a guy standing against a white background with a light bulb over his head. You know, that that actually is an idea. He's actually saying idea, but if your imagery produces an idea that can be marketed and used in brochures and websites, annual reports, that kind of stuff, that's what microstock is known for. And those images tend to sell the best. You can have a, a fabulous image of a white-tailed deer jumping over a fence with perfect golden sunshine shining on his fur it took you three hours of waiting in the cold to get it and it might sell five times you know so that gives you an example of how bad it can get for the wildlife photographer uh, the next con is which is I kind of alluded to earlier is that the masses don't pick your images based on the fact they're stunning they pick them based on whether they need that image or not so like I said you might have a fabulous sunset picture you might have a great image of a black bear or a grizzly it's just not a huge market for that in Shutterstock or in in, in uh, Alamy or I mean in uh, Al well Alamy too in the stock world itself there's just not a lot of market available to to use that image so realize that you're gonna get mad because your best images don't sell well the closest thing I can think of in wildlife to wildlife that sells well in the stock world are pets. Pet pictures sell rapidly. <clears throat> For example, I had a picture of a parakeet that has sold so many times I can't even count it. And it was just such a blah image. I mean, it just was, it was a good, it was a decent image, but it wasn't even, I don't even think it was tack sharp. I think it was sharp, but I don't think it was tack sharp. It was just an image of a couple parakeets. I mean, it, to me, it was just a an extra image I threw in there and it ended up selling I don't know, probably well over 100, 150 times that's sold at least. I don't know. <clears throat> I haven't checked the stats on that recently. But, you know, realize that. It's, 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 it's not what you think. You're not going to take a great picture of Yosemite National Park and sell a thousand images of it. Or sell it a thousand times. The other con about microstock agencies is microstock agencies don't give a flip about how much commission you make. They could care less about how much commission you make. They look at it like this. Hey, you're willing to sell your images for 25 cents a piece? Then <laughs> you obviously don't care about commission, right? So they're all the time doing things to to irritate contributors, lowering prices, lowering commission, making it tougher on us, really. Now, they talk a big talk. If you go on their website, you know, it 
it makes it sound like they really care about the the photographer and I suppose at some lower level they actually do care about the photographer but I don't think it's you know I think it's purely a money a money oriented kind of thing they're just looking at you know how many images can I sell how can I make the most profit so my shareholders look good you know we don't care about the photographer we can just give him 20 percent commission and be done with it so how could you you know I, I started thinking about how can you deal with these commissions you know, how can you push the market to make it a fair price I really don't know I've kinda of kicked the idea around of having guilds you know but in the world of globalization you know a, a, a person in India uh, selling imagery is gonna be a lot happier making 25 cents an image than a person in the UK or a person in the United States or Canada the first world there's a big first world third world gap you know with, with the commissions and I think in order to close that gap I think the only way you do it is you just start creating uh, guilds and what will happen is if you start doing that and you start all grouping together and saying yeah we're gonna agree that we're not gonna work for less than a dollar an image then what you've essentially done is now UK now the best photographers in UK and the best photographers in the United States will not sell their images but you know there's always going to be people out there willing to sell for 25 cents and so regardless of whether you set guilds up or unions or we've all talked about this stuff it, we've talked about it on on uh, uh, forums and such for so long it, I doubt anything's going to happen in that area but that's the only way I can think that we could try to regulate the price because the price is just it's it's a race to the bottom it's it's an absolute insult to photographers everywhere um, especially the veteran photographers it's a total insult to them to make 25 cents an image it's it's insanity is what it is absolute insanity so you know my other bullet point here was you know it's not sustainable as a living in a first world country you know you you can no longer I, I was a matter of fact I was out on uh, one of the forums the other day and there was a guy in there and I know this guy on the forums he's he's a pretty well known guy He's got about a he's got a port or a portfolio of about I have about 7,500 images somewhere around there 8,000 images I don't know, and uh, he's come to the conclusion that it's just not sustainable. You, know, you cannot make a living in a first world country um, doing micro stock photography. Now I know there's going to be people out there that are going to debate that point all day long. I I know because I see them all the time, but I I kind of agree with this guy. I think what I've noticed in my two and a half years of just experimenting with this is it is not sustainable as an income it's not sustainable even as a secondary income what it is or what it will do for most people is eventually it will give you enough money to keep your equipment from depreciating too much so every few years you could buy a new camera body or a new lens so this is kind of my feelings about the money situation because I think that's probably the biggest issue that people have out there right now and I am a capitalist and I believe that you know capitalism is a is a great way for an economy to run but there's times where it kind of fails and this is one of them it just kind of falls apart and you know I don't know what to do and I don't think there's a good answer to it right now the other thing I have against micro stock agencies is that the reviewers or the people that actually review your images as they come in are pretty much untrained high turnover rate they'll reject images for really stupid reasons that they're not even shouldn't even be rejected for they're obs absolutely obsessed with noise to the point where you you have to actually use the noise control features in Lightroom and so forth to actually smooth the image they actually want that much noise reduction I find that ridiculous personally again I mentioned before the focusing issues they're really weird about focus but that's pretty much it um, that's pretty much the the micro stock world as I currently see it and I know it's kind of a sad outlook on the whole thing but I'm gonna I'm, I'm the end of my experiment I've started at 2.5 I'm in 2.5 years into the experiment and it's gonna carry on for another year or two here so at the end of five years I'm basically gonna say yes or no will I stay doing it will I totally not do it 
one of the pros I forgot to mention about about stock photography in general is what it does for you is it keeps you motivated it keeps you out taking photographs and that's something that you can't put a value on since I became a micro stock contributor and a mid stock contributor I tend to take more photographs I tend to get out there more that's just a side effect of it and so for that I, I applaud them but we've really got to do something about the money situation because it's just not it's it's just laughable honestly it's laughable and you know like I said they're the Walmart of stock agencies they don't care they're gonna get a cheap product they're gonna sell it cheap and you know you don't go to Walmart to buy expensive high-end furniture or expensive carpeting or expensive glassware and things like that you go there to buy cheap Chinese made junk basically that's kinda how the stock agencies are unfortunately it's not entirely true because stock uh, micro if you go out and look at micro stock uh, agencies there are some phenomenal images out there just phenomenal images and people are you know they're willing to make 25 cents off them you know I don't know what to say uh, it's kinda sad really what's happened and a lot of it is because of digital you know a lot of it is because of the proliferation of, of digital cameras and pushing that the whole digital paradigm and you know Flickr and Facebook and that that whole you know why should I pay for imagery because I've got it all over the place you know that's that's the big deal I mean back when I was shooting 35 millimeter in medium format these limitations were there we didn't have the internet we had to shoot film. Film was expensive, and you had to make you know forty, fifty, two hundred dollars an image. You had to do it. You couldn't afford to film. It's a changing world, and I you know I don't know. This is my opinion, and it's not necessarily the opinion of people listening to this, but that's just how I feel about it. Like I said, I'll continue the experiment. I haven't I haven't given up on it yet. I want to see what it's going to be like when I get a a decent sized port out there. So the other thing I want to touch on just a little bit is the mid stock agency because I think I think there's money to be made here in the mid stock world. But in order to be successful in mid stock and I haven't really gone down this road. I have a fairly small port out there for mid stock. But I can tell you what has sold for me are images that are kind of like still lifes. I've sold a couple still lifes out there. Things like that are what's going to to sell for you out in there. Uh, things that have commercial value, things that have editorial value will sell. And so, you know, places like Alamy, they're going to be the stock agency for you. If you're really into that type of photography, that's the one you're going to try to get first. And you're going to want to learn how to sell images there. If, you know, if you want to be serious about stock photography. And then from there, I would recommend once you get so you're selling images on a fairly regular basis with Alamy, I would then try to move into the high-end stock agency. Um, but you're going to have to have something that sets you apart to get into that high-end agency. You're going to have to have something that makes you different. You know, high-end stock agencies are, quote, the big time. You know, that's where you you make more money. Anyway, that's that's pretty much the deal with, with stock agencies. And you can take them or leave them. There's a lot of people out there right now that are adamantly opposed to micro stock. I mean, there are a lot of photographers out there that will demean you, that will call you not a real photographer, that will say, you know, you're selling out. And I, I can't argue that, because in a way you kind of are. But I think there needs to be, I think we need to be talking about more than 25 cents an image. I think we need to be talking at least a dollar or two an image. Um, it's just it's just ridiculous that they're charging that that low. <clears throat> giving that low commissions. They're not charging that low. They're giving that low commissions. So that's pretty much all I had on that. I know it's kind of a boring episode, but I, I think it's an important episode for because the, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they're, they're thinking about doing this or they've heard bad things about it. I just wanted to lay it out there. My experiences, what are my hopes and dreams for this? I, I kind of forgot to go into that, you know. What are my hopes and dreams for Microstock? Well, again, higher commissions but even if commissions stay low you're going to have to have a, a portfolio out there of at least five to, to, to seven thousand images 
to make any kind of money at all. And they need to be good images, not just junk. Bear, keep that in mind. That's a lot of images. I haven't done the math on that, but that's a lot of images per day, even. Anyway, that's it. Let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, welcome to the, the Know Your Subject segment of the podcast. This is a segment that we just take an animal species, we discuss the animal, its behavior, and then how you can use this information to make you a better wildlife photographer. Again, I believe that this is something that all photographers need to take them to the next level. You have to know your subject, and you have to know what to expect from that subject. The sound you just heard was that of the roseate spoonbill. Cornell's Lab of Ornithology describes the roseate spoonbill as a bizarre wading bird of the south. The roseate spoonbill uses its odd bill to strain small food items out of the water. Its bright pink coloring leads many Florida tourists to think they have just seen a flamingo. I think they got it right here. This is a bizarre bird. This is a bird that basically has the body of a flamingo and the head of, say, a cross between a vulture and silverware. It has a, literally, it has a spoon for a bill. And what it does is it whips its head back and forth in the water and it stirs up the stuff on the bottom. And it, when it does that, it stirs up little organisms and, um, shrimp and things like that and it strains that and eat that's what it eats they're a unique bird they're they're pretty in flight um they have a <clears throat> i think a very majestic flight pattern long large wings they make great flight shots and uh they're bizarre enough that they actually make good portrait images too because you you just have to look at it it's kind of like a train wreck you kind of uh, what happened here we got a flamingo body and a, what kind of head is that but they have their own kind of beauty. And where you find these birds, and where I run into them, is in Florida. They are known to come as far up as you know South Carolina or the Carolinas. I think even in the southern North Carolina, they're seen sometimes. But pretty much the Carolinas is the limit. But where I go is I go down to, to Florida to photograph them. And they'll, they'll come in in flocks, generally. They'll come in in flocks and they'll feed for a while and then they'll fly off to another area and they'll feed for a while and that's kind of their day they'll sit out there and sleep for a little while fairly easy birds to photograph uh they're not extremely skittish of people they seem to be used to people in the florida area i photographed them at Merritt island last year and uh they'll kind of move in a pattern you can they'll take off or they'll they'll fly toward you, you what you basically do is you wait till you see a couple of them it's kind of in the lead coming in, and you'll you'll see they're in a pattern, a flight pattern. And what they'll do is they'll actually fly, they'll actually land into the wind. And you can actually sit there while they're circling for a landing, and you can just photograph them for an hour sometimes as as they fly in to a feeding location. And so it's it's not that hard to find them. You just have to go to like a place like Merritt Island or. I think there's, I haven't been there yet, but there's some places down in uh, southern Florida as well where it seems to be real hot, a real hot place for them year round. So, but they're a typical wading bird in some ways. They're very similar to the ibis, the white ibis. As a matter of fact, you'll see the white ibis with the roseate spoonbills quite often. And so they have a similar type of eating. You know, they both strain the, strain the stuff out of the water and uh, strain their food out of the water. Uh, any tips I can think of on photographing them, it's just be at the right place at the right time. I mean, it's, it's, they're going to, and make sure your lighting is right. You know, you always want to be looking, you know, when they're in flight, you always want to be looking at both the wind direction and the sun direction. So I see so many people that photograph flying birds and they're backlit and it just looks really bad because their faces get kind of muddy, their feathers get kind of muddy they're, just, they're not illuminated under the wings is dark the only exception to that rule that I've seen is I've seen photographs that were taken in early morning 
with slight backlighting, maybe coming from a, another angle, maybe off to the left a little bit, not total backlit, not totally backlit, but not side lit either. And I've seen them where you can actually see through the wings. Their wings have a transparency to them. And that's an interesting photograph. But generally speaking, you want that light behind you, over your shoulder, striking the bird as he comes in for a landing. Don't bother with departure shots. Birds flying away from you are dull. If you can position yourself in such a way that when the birds are taken off, they're flying toward you, that's really what you want. So <clears throat> you want the wind hitting your back. The rule of thumb is you want the wind to hit your back and you want the sun to hit your back. If you're in that position, you're in the perfect birds in flight position. And that's just how you handle these guys. Other than that, I recommend fairly long lenses, um, something in the 400 to 600 range, uh, anything shorter than that. And yeah, you can still make great shots of them, but you're going to want that flexibility of the, of the longer lens. And I, I just, I eventually came to the conclusion that I was just going to have to bite the bullet and buy a big lens. That's just what you have to do if you're going to be a bird photographer. That's just the way it is. Well, that's pretty much it. Sadly, that brings us to a close of another episode. I wanted to leave you with this quote by me, actually. Um, if you don't mind kneeling in high grass while waiting for an osprey to return to his nest, or mind laying in three inches of salt marsh muck waiting for a heron to strike the water, or mind sitting for hours in a blind for a songbird to perch in just the right spot, or mind getting up at 4 o'clock a.m. so you can get just the right lighting, you might have the makings to be a good wildlife photographer. Thanks for listening. Make it a great day. And get out there and enjoy nature. Bye-bye. Music for this episode was provided by Dr. Turtle.